Monday, July 29th, and this is episode number 761. Welcome to the show, my friends, and uh, I hope you had a great weekend. I hope you had a great weekend. I uh, just got back from Minneapolis and had one of the best weeks of headlining probably in, I don't know, five, six years. After COVID, it, you know, it takes a while to get your, your one-hour sea legs back on. And, you know, I don't get to tour enough in a headlining position because I'm always trying to slug away at these clubs and get in there. So when I get to do it, 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 it just feels amazing. It's scary, and it feels great at the same time because, you know, you go, fuck, I got to do an hour. But... I was at Acme, which is one of the top five clubs in America. And I was returning after that cancellation from March when I got, de uh, excuse me, deathly ill. And man, I couldn't have, I couldn't have had a better time. It was beautiful weather. And it was the 40 year anniversary of Purple Rain. So, you know, that's Prince's town. First Avenue still open, celebrating 50 years or whatever they've been open. And, and then the audiences were just fantastic. The people were great. The, the club owner and the, the employees at the club were fantastic. I got to see my good buddy Steve Gorman, who plays drums in the uh, Bond Scott tribute. And it was just a, a, just a magic magic week so i want to thank everybody that came out some really really cool people came out to the shows and uh thank you so much i'll talk more about it on my patreon this week i'll have a bonus episode on patreon and i'll be talking about uh minneapolis and prince purple rain and what else am i going to cover on that bonus episode um uh, some Harley riding with Bill and uh, a, a, a craft work record that I got recently that I did not know existed. Some good stuff. Some good stuff out there will be on the bonus episode. Talk some Olympics. Go Jira playing the Olympics. Uh, speaking of 40 year anniversary, my guest today is celebrating a 40 year anniversary of the Twisted Sister record, Stay Hungry. That is Mr. J.J. French. He is my man, my guest, my friend here today. And I did his podcast about a month ago, J.J. French Connection. It was a two-parter. And I interviewed him about seven years ago at his house out in New York. But over the last two, three months, we've really kind of bonded and I realize this guy, I could talk to this guy for hours. I could hang out with him for hours. And it's so great late in life to actually meet a, a, a person that you really bond with. You know, the older you get, you're like, this is my crew. I got four or five friends and that's it. But when you get somebody like, uh, the connection I have with J.J. French now, it's just mind-boggling. And it's just, it's just beautiful. So he came by, and uh, we laid down a nice little 45-minute chat on all the stuff we love, watches, hi-fi systems, rock and roll. There's not much more in life. Oh, guitars. <laughs> the only thing we didn't talk about was cars because I don't think he's a car guy living in New York, Upper West Side. I should have asked him. But I think that JJ will probably be on multiple times in my life of the show. Here I am 12 and a half years in. This is his second time. I'm sure he'll be on a bunch throughout the years because he's, it's just that kind of guy where we go, holy shit, did you hear this or that? And sit down and talk. Anyway, next headlining shows will be in Springfield, Missouri, August 30th and 31st. Please come out, tell people, put it on the internet, spread the word, post on Twitter, 
post on Instagram, TikTok, whatever you use, it really helps me. Also, leave a review on iTunes for Let There Be Talk and subscribe to my YouTube channel. I love you guys, and I'm so happy you tuned in today because this episode is very fun. Sit back. Candles are lit, my friends. It is J.J. French. I have many stories in my life that are really bizarre, and uh, I'm a true believer, and I've said it many times on the podcast, that when you're born, your life is laid out for you. I believe there's a map, and you try to get off it, and you get bounced back in, and there's weirdness in my life over the years, and this one is right up there. So I meet my guest today, who's on for a second time, Mr. J.J. French. Awesome. Uh, Twisted Sister being one of the greatest bands of the 80s that I've seen many times and had the honor of uh, bringing on stage at the Roxy for their second to last gig so far. But uh, I interview him at his house in the Upper West Side. And here we are like seven years later. I do his podcast we're talking, he says, my daughter lives in Los Feliz, and next thing you know, we live in the same fucking building, and bam, another weird-ass story. And you know their dog. And I know their dog. <laughs> Everybody knows the dogs in the building. They know you, you know them. You know, you could, it's, a, it's incredible. You could pick any building in the world, any location in the world. You and I are having a con- phone, we're, we're doing a podcast on my podcast. Yeah. I'm talking to you, you're in LA, I'm in New York, and like, hey, yeah, where do you live? Oh, I live in LA, and it turns out that you live basically the neighbor of my stepdaughter, and of course she just had a kid so we we're coming out here and i said i can't believe you're in the same building i mean what are the chances yeah and also since i first interviewed you years ago i did your podcast and and we we really bonded on that podcast over everything we love and we're kind of very similar humans we go for it in life we've always rolled the dice and gambled on ourselves we love watches, we love guitars, we love music, hi-fi, sound systems, everything. We're kind of the same human. It, it, it is amazing because, I, because you can explain or describe nuances of watches, which I will totally understand, right. but most people do not understand. Uh, because it goes beyond the, hey man, you got a Rolex, hey man, you know, like that kind of stuff. It goes really into the movements and into the histories. And then we talk guitars, we know the histories, the depth of the histories, the depth of the models, the depth of the players that made those models so important. And then we talk audio, and I'm talking to someone who just, un- who gets it 100% about where people's understanding or lack thereof exists in the audio world. Because look, Fine, Apple iPods, great, iPod earphone, fine, makes you happy, I'm all for it, makes you happy, but if you really want to know what it's like to own a Bugatti of audio, and you can only speak that to people who really get it, and you get it, you understood it. The minute you said, well, man, Macintosh is the Rolex, of, I'm like, dude, you understand, I just made that analogy <laughs> in an article that I just wrote for the Tracking Angle, which is probably the most esoteric um, uh, magazine online right now which really dedicates itself to vinyl really really super vinyl and you know to real crazy audiophiles vinyl may be looked on although there is one other level of insanity you know that's the real to real tape guy oh yeah which oh, has yeah. come back in another niche yeah. section really big like they're spending eighty ninety thousand dollars on only play versions of 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 tape of, of tape decks that are either refurbished older Studers, yeah. right, or older Tanbergs or older Reeboks, or completely built from the ground up by lunatics. And by the way, for those of you who, who wonder reel-to-reel tapes, let me tell you how crazy it gets. Record labels who own the masters of some of the most famous albums like Dark Side yeah. or... The high audio yeah, ones, Asia, Steely Dan. The Steely Dan stuff. Carol well, Miles King. Davis, Kind of Blue, which is the biggest selling jazz album. Right. They will sell you master 
quality 10 inch reel two track tapes for 450 bucks to play back on your 80,000 yeah yeah you know know. linda perry uh who's a friend of mine and great songwriter producer from four non bonds and and signed me years ago she had a reel to reel and she was obsessed with it and i'd go to her house and she put on tapestry one time and i was just like there was something so 1972 about it you know, you're just sitting there and you're watching these big reels spin and, and the way the thing's sitting on the counter, you're like, look at that thing. And the sound, you know, people need to understand when you're listening to a record and, and who knew how great records could truly sound because the guys who were, pl- who were plating them and, and, and pressing them 50 years ago had no idea about how well you could actually recover and retrieve. You're still retrieving on a micro groove that's the size of a hair with a needle, which is the micro groove of the, at the size of a hair follicle, whereas with tape, you've got space. You have space. And so when people say, well, what's the whole point of high-end audio? Um, I try to explain to them, it's the ability to get closer to the mixing console. It's the ability to get closer to what the guys who are mastering that record were hearing at the time they were mastering through those speakers because you can't get any closer than the mixing console. You can never right. get closer. That's it. You can't get in the room. It's total. But you, that's a BS theory. You can't get in the room. As close as you get is as close as the, final, as the mix down that takes place in the studio. And you want to know something? The truth is that if you were to take Joe Blow and say to them, take your favorite record. And then if you could transport that person into the room where they mixed it, he'd go, I didn't know it sounds like that. Yeah. Because that is where high-end audio is getting you Yeah, to that level. Funny thing about that, since I played music and recorded records and stuff, and you have, obviously, it was wild when you do the mix down, you know, from the two inch to the quarter inch, you get the mix, and then you would cut a cassette and go out to the parking lot to listen to it on a Jensen triaxles and a fucking, you know, uh, blow punt stereo to see what it would sound like in a car. So you were mixing down to get car fucking levels. Because you knew that's how it was going to be purchased. 100%. And, you know, Tom Worman, when we were doing Stay Hungry, and it's so crazy because we're sitting here on this beautiful deck right now looking at at california and at southern california so this and 40 years ago this this month you know stay hungry is out Masterpiece. our videos are out you know we're right. not gonna take it i want to rock so what so we would record the tracks at um at cherokee which I was on it. fairfax right yeah killer and and then we would take the mix and we would drive to worman's house which was off of laurel canyon back in the day and we'd go and, and we'd go into his kitchen and he had a Sanyo $99 cassette player. Yeah. And he plays the track back. And I, I'm expecting to see this big stereo system in the house. He goes, he says, JJ, he goes, it's got to sound great on that. Man. That's what 99% of the people are going to listen to. That's it. it. He goes, yeah. it's got to be that, that car stereo, that Sanyo. If it's, not, if it's not working on that, it's not working. Yeah. And I thought, man, he's down. But, you know, it's, it's the opposite of a Steely Dan or a Pink Floyd record. Let's be honest. Of course. Those guys were making audiophile quality records. 100%. Be Mobile best. Fidelity reissues, oh, all of that, yeah, just the highest. Stuff. And whenever somebody wants to sell a goddamn stereo speaker to you, you go in, the first thing you put on is either Dark Side of the Moon or Asia. And you sit down and you go, look, I know that this record already set. You're already cheating with how great this record already sounds. Yeah. So let's put on some fucking piece of junk old record and let's hear that. Yeah, let's throw Blue Cheer on there and see yeah, what happens. Right. Yeah. <laughs> let's get Dickie's bass through there, you know? <laughs> you know, or a monkey's out. Like, you know, something that's just like right. perfunctorily recorded yeah. and not done at the highest levels of audio. Because, you know, they always used to use Hotel California, it was another one of them. And look, I sold the stuff at Lyric High Five. Yeah. I knew the game. Yeah. You know, yeah. you want to buy, you want to get someone to buy a gear. Here's what you do. If you want to sell a piece, you make that the second piece you play because it's always the second one they'll buy because it sounds different. Not necessarily better, but their brain. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Oh, I hear that. Yeah. Oh, it's, wow. Man. I used to sell motorcycles and I'd tell people, if you want to sell a motorcycle to a guy, they'd be like, these are kind of dangerous, huh? And I'm like, yeah, if you're a pussy. You know, because right away they don't want to look like a pussy, so they're like, I ain't no pussy, I'll take two. You know what I mean? So it's similar with the stereo thing, you know? Yeah, You're well, like, people used to come into lyric. Now, you know, I was, 
before uh, Lyric Hi-Fi was was probably the most famous high-end hi-fi store and it was connected to the absolute sound and if you understand the politics of high-end audio you'll understand that there were players in the game Harry Pearson from Absolute Sound Mike Kay from Lyric that it was like a mafia and yeah. they could control the whole system. And all of these high-end stores around the world basically went off of the key to Lyric Hi-Fi. And I remember when I started to understand the, the s selling to these people who are spending all this money on this equipment. So these old guys would show up and they would say, well, my friend owns the Jadis table, so I just want to buy it because he owns it. Yep. You know what I mean? They don't know about audio file, nothing. They just say, I got money. My friend has it. I'm buying. Yeah. So they would come in. And, you know, they would take them in the back room where the most expensive system was. At those, those days, the IRS four-column speakers were like $100,000. And you had the Jadis tables, which was like uh, maybe, um, uh, maybe 25000 bucks, And you had Levinson amplifiers, you know, all that kind of thing. Because they were still beyond max in those days. Of course, yeah. That was about yeah. the best you could get. Audio research stuff, right? And uh, the wife, he'd come in with the wife. And the wife would walk in, and she'd sit outside the room. And I'd say to her, why aren't you in there listening? She goes, oh, that's his thing. I said, he's deaf. Yeah. She said, what do you mean? I said, by the time you're rich enough to hear uh, to buy it, your ears aren't good enough to hear it. I said, you should go in because you actually are going to be hearing this shit because I bet you he's listening to the baseball games with the sound turned up on the TV because he's freaking deaf. And she said, it's exactly it is. I said, yeah, because... He's just being sold, man. Yeah. I mean, he's buying great stuff. Don't get me wrong. Right. But you can hear, because women's hearing is a lot better than men's hearing. We lose our hearing. Starting yeah. about four. Well, we lose it because we don't want to hear them anymore. So it's, well, uh, what it's do they call that? Intelligent design, <laughs> yeah, my friend. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's why I believe in God. <laughs> uh, you know what? My wife and I had this conversation once years ago. She goes, you know, you have dementia Alzheimer's, yeah. you're definitely not paying any attention to me. This is this. I call it an argument. She said it was a spirited discussion. <laughs> you yeah. Know what I mean? yeah. So I said to her, okay, you know, I'm a Jew. I go to a doctor every week for the hell of it. So I have to sit in my doctor's office the next week. I said, my wife says I have dementia. He says, JJ, let me explain something to you. He goes, if I show you car keys and you recognize them as car keys, you do not have dementia. <laughs> he said, if you tell me you don't know what they are, I may send you to NYU. He says, but you don't have dementia. He said, if I had a dollar for every guy over 60 who comes in here and tells me his wife has dementia, I'd be an ultra millionaire. He said, but I'm going to send you to an audiologist. Get your hearing checked. Now, as you know, dude, we play loud. Oh, yeah. We played super loud. And for years, I did not wear hearing protection. Yeah. And we played through the real deal. Triple marshals. Yeah. Triple Hunter marshals. Waters. Triple marshals, all the, everything was plugged in at 10, right? So the woman does a two-hour test, and she says, Mr. French, I have good news and bad news. You know, the good news is, considering your age and occupation, your hearing isn't uh, all that bad. The bad news is you really aren't paying any attention to you. <laughs> Selective hearing, buddy. <laughs> selective hearing. It is the truth, man. It is selective hearing. Let me talk to you a little bit about this, because you had reached a high, high level of fame and Twisted Sister, and then it, it burns to the ground. And I never reached that level, but I did play music for 25 years. And at one point, I was like, okay, I'm done. And I started selling Harleys. You are somebody that I can really relate with that once you stepped off the road and you're working at the stereo store, did you feel a little bit, uh, which I did, of kind of relief of jumping out of the grind and just being kind of like, oh, wow, I'm, I'm here now. I can go home and sleep in my own bed for a little bit. I felt that for a little bit. Um, you know what I mean? Are you like, oh, shit, or did, where each day at work where you're going, fuck, I used to be on giant stages. You know, we, we struggled for so many years right. in the clubs, which most people truly don't understand what that was like, because it was unlike any other band. I don't care. name I, When people say the Beatles worked really hard in, in, in Hamburg, I said, look, dude, don't compare the two. We're not the Beatles. I'm not saying we're the Beatles, but don't compare their three years playing these German Rathskellers um, to what we did. We spent... 10 solid years playing in bars, 250 nights a year, four or five shows a night, five nights or six nights a week. You know, this is what we, this is how we learned our craft. When things finally happened and it exploded, 
we were prepared like an 18-month pregnant woman to give birth to this massive baby. So it did not surprise us that the world finally recognized the greatness that it was. The crash, however, um, the crash was perceived by me in a very strange way. Because I don't drink and I don't do drugs, I didn't, it wasn't clouded by weirdness. Yeah. In fact, I knew exactly what was coming. You know, the, you can feel it. No, well, I felt it, but I knew it wasn't a shock. I basically, I created the crash to happen because I I could see the writing on the wall was was where it was going to come. And by the way, the the crash preceded our personal crash preceded the end of the hair metal band scene, which was taken down by Nirvana in one afternoon. So had we lasted a couple more years, it would have been the same fate that Warren Poison and everybody else felt. Three years later, when T Smells Like Teen Spirit came on and their careers were wiped out like the dinosaur after the meteor. Right. right? Yeah. So we had already ended. But, you know, there's, there, there's, there's three kinds of people in this world. The people who make it happen, watch it happen, and go, what happened? I was never going to be the kind of person that said, what happened? I was either going to watch it happen or make it happen. So as the end was coming, I saw it. And it hurt severely. It coincided with the divorce. It was like a whole mishmash of stuff and the bankruptcy and all that. And I was kind of bemused at the irony of my life. Like as smart as I was and as, hot, as big as we got, I said, wow, John, wow. So this is what 15 years worth of work is like. I walked out of the bankruptcy court on Bowling Green. I remember walking up Broadway that day I filed for bankruptcy. And I'm thinking to myself, damn, all that fucking work, all that success. And now all I have to show for is two subway tokens and a guitar and no wife. Like, um, and I said to myself, there's got to be a better way. And, and so right away, I go into this survival mode. And a friend of mine owned a gym chain. And he said to me, listen, we, we just bought a, some pool halls in, uh, in, uh, in Manhattan. And I'll pay you to run the pool hall overnight. And to save you the indignity of running the pool hall, of people wondering when they recognize you, tell them you're an owner of the pool hall. And I went, thank you very much. So I was able to say that I was an owner. Yeah, so you're hall. not getting that like, what happened? No, people go, what are you here? I said, yeah, yeah, we're, yeah. On, we're on a break. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I own, I got my partners. Oh, yeah, yeah, totally cool, right? Yeah. So he helped me, paid me weekly. We managed his, uh, his nephew for a while. Um, but when the stereo store gig happened, you know, I knew stereos since I was 15 years old. So uh, the owner of the store knew that I knew. He kind of wondered. He was a good friend of mine. I was a, I was a customer there buying high-end shit only two years earlier, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know, now he goes, he goes, what are you doing these days? I said, ah, nothing much. He goes, well, do you want to? He goes, you know, how would you, like to, would you like to sell? And I said, if I can meet the manufacturers and buy everything it costs, I'll do it. That's yeah. that's yeah. how it became valuable yeah. to me. Same right? with me. If I could get healthcare and motorcycles at fucking wholesale, and and it was something I loved. So it's real similar. Very similar. If you're doing something that you fucking love, where it's music, and then holy shit, I'm selling stereos. Okay, this ain't that bad because I fucking love this stuff. Yeah. But also at I'm, the other end of it, it starts to give you. Uh, these different journeys in life, which is amazing. Yeah, you but know? here's the weird thing, yeah. though, man. I would have to go into houses on Park Avenue to install the equipment. Oh, yeah. And I'd have to go into the workers' entrance, mm. right? Now I'm a Manhattan peasant. Guy, yeah. And all of a sudden, I'm working at Lyric Hi Fi on the Upper East Side. Yeah. And when I come in to measure the rooms and shit, I, I, they're directing me to the back elevators. And I'm thinking to myself, this is where J.J. French is winding up in the back <laughs> elevators of the service cars of these Upper East Side apartments. And then I'd go to the apartments. Yeah. And invariably, I would see my records. Oh my God! Oh my, and, and, That's and, the crazy and part. I wouldn't say a word because I. Oh, would, no this way. was no pity party. No, I'd never said my name was JJ. I was John. Yep. No connection whatsoever. I did not want to go that that route at all. So yeah. now I'm there for like three years, right? For three years, and I'd be at night. We're cleaning up, and I'm sweeping up, and you know. Now, granted, uh, Levinson's there, and all these high end audio, and they're giving me stuff because I work there, so they want me to own it, which is kind of cool. Yeah. But I'm sitting there going, "Is this how?" I like to your point of what do we think our ultimate goal in this life is? Is this all there is, or is there something there? I kept kept saying, yeah. "There's got to be something better." I know there's something better. I can't wind up like my father was a jewelry salesman. I'm not going to wind up like Willie Loman. I'm not going to be. A salesman. There's something going on, and as right. fate would have it, 
as I have told you, the Seven Dust project kind of came up, and I did it on a, you know, I just kind of did it flippantly, thinking maybe the record will sell 10,000 copies, and lo and behold, I produced this record with Mark Mendoza, and the record is almost platinum, and becomes the biggest selling record. The two singles off the record become the records of the year on alternative uh, metal radio, and now I'm managing the band, and now I'm making more money than I ever made with Twisted. So now, and I'm still selling stereos because I'm sure that the other shoe's gonna drop. Of course. And the owner of the store says, JJ, you can't be downstairs in the basement booking your band on tour when someone wants to buy a Levinson upstairs. You yeah. Know, pick your choice. And so I finally said to him, maybe it's time to go. Yeah. You know? And I quit the selling stereos, but not before. All those connections became permanent connections. So now I get to wallow in my high-end audio-ness because I'm really good friends with all these guys. Yeah. And so I ma maintained it. But you know what? Twisted comes back after 9-11. Um, and um, as fate would have it, the band becomes gigantic, bigger than ever in Europe and South America, like playing massive shows. I mean, our last tour in 2016, I don't think we played to crowds less than 60,000 up to 110,000. Um, we walked away on our terms. So when people say to me, you know, how do you feel about not playing? I said, listen, I've done 9,000 performances. If you add up all the five shows a night. No, yeah, no, same no, here. I'm at 6,000. I'm at 9,000 9, performances. I don't necessarily need to stand in front of a mirror and play air guitar anymore. Like the J.J. French thing has kind of burned itself out. But I'm a blues guy. I'm not a metal guy. And recently I played at Jazz Fest with a blues band. And I, I, Steve Jordan was from the Rolling Stones was the drummer and Devel Crawford was Love the him. pianist and had a great, fantastic time. And um, I'm recording a new song right now. I'm doing a blues song. And um, uh, Rocky Athis, who was John Mayall's last guitar player, is going to be playing guitar on it. Devel Crawford's playing guitar on it. It's being produced by Bobby Held, who produced Joe Bonamassa's uh, first album, first yep. blues album, and Joe Bonamassa may be playing on it as well, and I'm re-energized. But the Twisted Days, bottom line is, if we never play again, it'll be okay, but I never will say never, because right. it could happen, but I'm not sitting there itching to be J.J. French from Twisted Sister yeah. anymore. That's just the, the bottom line. There is some rumblings every year where, uh, which by the way, I want to repeat this if people haven't heard this story ricky rackman an old friend of mine from the cat house days probably other than the limelight in new york the greatest rock hang of all time cat house um had this anniversary uh asked me to co-host with him at the roxy they surprise everybody, Twisted Sister. I think this is like seven years ago. Seven or years ago yeah. yeah. Uh, they're going to play four songs. I've got it on video where I'm standing on the stage with Ricky. We're like, ladies and gentlemen, Twisted Sister. And I'd seen Twisted Cow Palace. I'd seen them, you know, all over California back in the day. But to be two feet away from fucking like D as a front man, it was like, alarming i was like this guy i don't know how old he is what is he like 65 he's, he's, no no i'm i'm oh, i just turned 72 D right. is six i think he's 68 now it was fucking insane like the band comes on and it is like an absolute fucking the the, the bullet train in japan you know what i mean just like what the f he comes out he pulls out his fucking ponytail things. He does that, you know, you can't stop rock and roll. Like, do, 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 do. And then they kick in. You guys are killing so hard. I'm fucking floored. I'm standing there like, what the fuck? To be that close, you know, like two feet away in a small club. Yeah, it was and that's the only way we know how to play. You know, we're yeah. a very predatory band. Again, people don't understand this is that the band grew up in a circuit in a, where you had to blow other bands away in the clubs in order to get paid more money. You built a right. following up, so we became very predatory. So the idea of going on stage and just grabbing people by the throat and annihilating them became our stock and trade. Uh, and I'm very proud of it. Yeah, I am because you know it's not that we don't like other bands. It's not like I don't want other bands to blow us away. If you can, yeah. bring it on. 
all the the only person that's going to take advantage of it is the audience. Give them a better show. If you can kick our ass, kick our ass. Except you ain't gonna kick our ass. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But you may think now. Our attitude is: by the end of any given night in any show in any festival, I can tell you this: there may be bands that play better than us, but you're going to believe we were better than them because we're going to play a show that will yeah. make you feel like that, even yeah. though there's bands that may be better. And you know what? Maiden, ZZ Top, ACDC, all these bands, we play with them all the time. And I love it. I love it. Bring it on. By the way, because you're such an ACDC fanatic. Yes. You know, Brian Johnson came on stage with us in England and did a whole lot of Rosie with yeah, us. Yeah, you and, said you know, that. And, yeah. and, then, and I, I, when you come to Manhattan, next time you're yeah. in, oh, yeah. you come over, I'll play you the video. Yeah. It is like... I get chills. Like Brian, like Brian comes in. Well, most people don't know this. You're such an ACDC fan. But back in 1983, when the band was first in England doing... Yeah, under, actually flick of the switch tour. Yeah, oh, 82. We, that we, was about to rock. Yeah, we were, we were in Newcastle. Yeah. And Brian lived in Newcastle. And he sent somebody over to the hotel and said, Brian wants you to come over for dinner. And he picked us up and he took us over to his house. We hung out all night, so we became kind of friends. So we kind of, we were friends. And we said to him, you know, we do so much ACDC songs. Like, Shoot Him Down is an ACDC song. Let's face it. It's like, right, yeah. Right. Try that ACDC songbook. I mean, so Brian is at, he's hosting the, um, this uh, biker festival in England. Yeah. You know, about 10 years ago. And he comes, hey, laddies. You know, I was like, yeah. hey, laddie. Hey, so, uh, let so me tell he you. Said, we said, man, why don't we do a song? He goes, what have you done? I said, well, we used to do anything. I don't know. How about A Whole Lot of Rosie? He goes, done. We yeah. hadn't played it since 1982. Yeah. So now it's, you know, it's like 15 years. We haven't played the song since 82. Went up on stage, man, and killed it. And absolutely floored it. And Brian walks off stage. And he says to me, JJ, that's the greatest crowd reaction I've ever heard. And I looked at Brian. And I said, Brian, thank you, but you're fucking foolish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. said, thank you very much. Yeah. You happen to front one of the greatest bands on the planet Earth. I'm sure you've had exactly the same reaction, but I appreciate it. And then Brian's standing there, and my bass player, Mendoza, says, my girlfriend loves you. Would you would you talk to her on the phone? And he goes, oh, laddie, I'd love to. You know, so Mendoza calls his girlfriend, Carrie, and says, Carrie, I got somebody for you. And hands the phone to Carrie. And Brian goes, hi, Carrie. It's Brian Johnson from ACDC. And all of a sudden, he pulls the phone away. And he's like, he's holding it out like this. And Mark picks up the phone. And his girlfriend's going, don't you get one of your drunk, stupid fucking English friends to call me and tell me he's Brian Johnson. You're a fucking idiot. And tell your fucking friend he's an idiot too. And I'm filming this, by the way. Yeah. When we got back to New York, I played it for Carrie. I said, you were talking to Brian Johnson. But the bottom line was that someone else saw Brian Johnson do the same thing and said, hey, would you call my friend? Do you know that Brian Johnson stood there for two hours? Fuck. Everybody saw it. There was a line. There was a line of people. Brian's just sitting there. Hey, Brian, call my friend. One of the nicest guys. He's unbelievable. Kevin right? Ronnie Dio, nicest yeah. guys in the business. Oh man, yeah. it's it's funny to think about where there's these people, and I get it probably twice, three times a week where they're like, "Once Bond died, I was out," and I was like, "How can you deny one of the greatest vocal performances of three albums ever?" Back in Black, Those About to Rock, Flick of the Switch. When you listen to those vocals, they're so fucking incredible that I'm in awe. Like, I couldn't even do it. I can sing a pretty goddamn good Bon Scott. I do it once a year for a, a, a show. But to hear those vocals of Have a Drink on Me and, and fucking Hell's Bells, dude, I mean, it is alarming how crazy those vocals are. Well, think about how lucky Van Halen was to get Hager. Yep. And how lucky ACDC was to get to Unbelievable. Get I mean, talk about lightning in a bottle. Yeah. You, you catch it once, and you're like already ahead of the game by a million percent. Catch it twice? No fucking way. It's like winning the lottery twice. Yeah, yeah. How do you do that? Like, how does Hager come in and create that world for them that was even bigger in a way than David Lee Roth, you know? Just and the genius of that is having somebody that doesn't sound like the former guy. Now you get the cover band guy, you slide him in, you're like, here's our guy, he sounds exact to Steve like, Perry like, or whatever. Like, like Steve Perry. Yeah, like right. That guy for Journey, which is perfect. Yeah, Arnell. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. But to back then, to get a guy, because, you know, Back in Black comes out, and like two months later, they're playing the Cow Palace. I'm there. It's like in February, right? We have no idea what it's going to sound like when he sings the Bond shit. 
at all because they're back then there was no you know youtube or they're not putting instagram videos so here we are at rehearsal so you go they open with hell's bells you're like this is crazy second song's like shot down in flames you're like oh oh yeah okay he, he's doing it then you know then all of a sudden they're doing like highway to hell you're like oh all right but you have no idea till you're there how, I, I'm curious about this. Did you see the Axl Rose version of ACDC? I didn't see it live. Um, How they, did he do? Because I he didn't killed. Watch it. He, he killed. killed. It. He killed. He, did it? he killed. Okay. People were constantly like, they're delusional. Like, Dean, you should be in there, man. You should be doing that. And I was like, come on, man. I'm totally unknown. You know, I could do the gig, but I'd have to train for like six months. Get ready. You know, and then take the abuse every night of like, where's Brian? You know, they kicked him out and all that. Right. Where and the social media blowback. Oh, my shit. God. For life. Yeah. For life. Um, it would have to be like, here's all the money. You've done comedy. It's your favorite thing you've ever done. Would you cash it all in for one year tour with ACDC or do you do, do you keep doing comedy? And it would be a serious fucking thought like i don't know but my point is axel had been on tour for two years uh by now with gnr he was ready to go it takes that much time when you're in your late 50s early 60s acdc plays and this is no fucking lie 120 db on stage i've stepped on stage when they were on and i was like oh fuck no it is so brutal and you have to be ready and then do it every couple nights. Yeah, people don't understand that the, the um, physicality of playing high-end metal. They don't understand it. They don't get it. You know, high-end metal is like a, it's like a football game. It's like going to war. Yeah. And you can't just go. You need to, get, you need to train back up. Like when people say to me, like when Twisted came back in 2003, uh, you know, the first show we played was Sweden Rock, and we we hadn't played in front of a crowd like that in years, and we weren't ready. And even though we were headlining, because they were given the headlining spot over Yes and Jethro Tull, which, yeah. believe me, was mind-blowing, because I would see those guys at, when I was in high school, yeah. and now they're opening for me, which was really weird. I felt embarrassed yeah I yeah to do. that's always a weird thing right you're like it's my I, idols I, i'm apologizing to them yeah yeah said, the promoter did this it's not me you know anyway um we it, it wasn't a good show and we realized it and so when we came back to do bang your head uh three weeks later we said to our agent put us in a smaller room the day before we need to get our sea legs back totally. because you have to get it's kind of like if you're a lineman in a pro football game and you're facing another dude who weighs exactly what you do, which is 325 pounds, and you're about to hit helmets, you better be ready to hit helmets, motherfucker. Because if you're not ready to get your head hit, you don't know what's coming. It's going to send a lightning bolt through your body and freak you yeah. out. And you need to understand that psychology. Also, as a guitar player, especially in a two-guitar band, the intrinsic ability for the meshing of the distortions to be correct if you follow you know correct you get it right yes. you gotta get it right gotta get those guitar parts right and and um it's an art form that's why we can do it and a lot of people can it's an art form and yeah. only you develop that art form by doing it thousands of times and we need to get our sea legs back so when you're on a stage with acdc and you're feeling the concussive impact of 120 db which is like being it's like standing under an sst at takeoff oh it's fucking intense dude especially the side fills because the older the band gets the less they can hear so it gets louder and louder and you walk by one of those side fills and fucking Angus hits a you're yeah. like, what yeah. the yeah. fuck? Yeah, you, need to, you know what? I was wearing, by the end, I was wearing these ear protectors that were almost totally, completely shut me off. Yeah. And the problem with wearing protectors, because you need to, is that you can't hear what's going on. You can barely hear what's going on. So I'd be on an ego ramp in front of 80,000 people standing out like 80 feet from the stage and playing a solo like, you know, yeah. and going, these people have no idea that I almost have no idea where I am. <laughs> and the only reason why I know where I am is because I know the song set is so perfectly the same every night. Yeah. And I would, I'd look behind me to see either AJ's drum head or, or, or port noise, and I'd go, I'm on the beat. But frankly, I don't know if I'm in tune or not, which is why I change guitars every song because I am completely isolated from yeah. the music and i'm thinking to myself if people had any idea that i am not listening to any of this stuff yeah it's it's crazy 
My it's problem cool. is, uh, now I have not sang with in-ears, so I really want to sing with in-ears, maybe at the next year's Bond Scott Bash, because then I can, you know, operate on my own fucking frequencies. And because with Bond, it's all nuances, you know? It's like, in the beginning, back in 1955, it, it, you got to be able to do the character. Now, if you're screaming it like, in the beginning, it's, it's, it's wrong. It's got to have the nuances and everything. So my problem is when people play way too loud, now I'm fucking forcing it or I start to sing flat because the bass sounds weird. It's rumbling through the wood floor. Did you watch any of the Axel footage? No. I, you know what? I think I saw a clip here and there because I wanted to see how bad he looked. Right. And, you know, and he looked so different from what he was, but he was cutting it. Here's the point. Yeah. There were people that were laughing about the idea of him replacing it, and then people saw it and said, wow, he did it. So the bottom line yeah. was whatever naysayers uh, and social media mavens who do nothing more than just you know, diss everything in the world. That's all they do. Everybody said that he actually pulled it off he fucking killed it and what i like to bet what he did the, the most which is what i would do if i would have done the gig was he whipped out deep tracks you know kicked in the teeth again doggy dog stuff that you know look my only real and i understand the business and i've told told it a million times and and you know it too you go out on tour you have to play these certain songs and twisted sister stones right now but I also don't really believe that, that excuse because I think once in a while, I think a band should do this like Maiden does. They tour and go, this one's for the fans, this one's for the super fans, like every other tour. I think if Stones went to Vegas and said, you come out, we're only playing Sticky Fingers. People are going to be fucking going. No satisfaction. You're not going to hear that. You're not going to hear fucking, you know, street fighting man or anything. You're hearing sticky fingers. You know, my point is with ACDC and all these bands, they have some of the best fucking records. Isn't it weird that they have those about the rock record, which is 10 of the greatest rock tunes, and they only play those about the rock? They don't play a song off Flick of the Switch. It's weird how a band could have records. They never, ever play the song ever again. Well, I think I've wrestled with this thought a yep, lot. Right. I said to myself, Twisted does 17 songs, right? And right. We put down, we, our, our, what we think is this. If we said to the average fan, we had a survey, these are the 17 songs we're playing. We'll remove three to put anything else in. Which three would you take out? Yeah. To put three that are more esoteric. And the fact is that if you did that, you, were, you are then... 95% of the people want to hear those three and not the three songs I get that it. the fans want to hear. So if you're playing to 95% or are you playing to the 3%? Now, the truth is, when you come up with a new song, most people just get up and go to the bathroom. Yeah, piss tracks, they, I call them. It's a piss track. Yeah. So, so we did a song called 30. We recorded a new song many years ago called 30. We started playing it live. And Dee started saying, okay, folks, tonight we're going to be doing a new song. I'll give you plenty of warning. He goes, uh, it's the song that you're going to go out and get a drink or take a piss. You know, we're three songs away from the, from the piss song, two songs away. And he would embarrass the people so much that they wouldn't leave <laughs> because now they don't want to look like schmucks <laughs> by getting up and leaving. But the fact of the matter is I know the best. that 95% I know. of – Look, you go see Dylan. Dylan is indecipherably bad. You don't even understand it. But if you're a deep Dylan guy and yeah. Dylan's like so esoteric, you go, he's like an interpretive artist and he does it the way he wants to. But you know what? The average person doesn't give a shit. They want to hear Blown in the Wind like Blown in the Wind. Of course. They want to hear like a Rolling Stone like a Rolling Stone. They like to hear a song that sounds kind of like the record because that's how they remember. So Dylan doesn't do that game, right? I know the set list thing because every year we do the ACDC tribute and as soon as we go to a deep track of uh, like kicked in the teeth or uh, you know something from fly on the wall maybe yeah. no no we only do bond so oh, overdose oh. which I think or fucking uh, can I sit next to you girl the people are just staring at you and the low that you can feel you're like oh 
You know what I mean? And here I'm like, we're going to really get him with this deep track. And it's three people out there going, holy shit. So I understand the biz. I understand but it. You, I'm not you dumb. You realize that you're doing a festival show and there's 100,000 well, people out different. there. And you it, have to keep them up. You've got to go. Yeah. You can't risk no. lowering the energy. You know what yeah, I mean? I get you can't it. lower the energy. Yeah. You've got to no. go from lily pad to lily pad to lily pad to lily pad. you got to right. hop them. If you throw in the price, which is the one song that takes it down, yeah. you better oh. come right back up with something right I after fucking that, love man. the price. Yeah. You know, oh my God. You got to be really careful when you kind of do it. So that's why it's always debatable as to what songs you play, what songs you leave out. But I will tell you, if the biggest mistake that a lot of bands no longer make is they make a new record, come out, almost play the new record. It's like, if you want to really just blow, you know, screw the audience, do that, because most of them will look at you like you got two heads. Oh, yeah. But well, at this ticket price, fuck yeah. It's like, what are you doing? It was two fifty for the ticket. Yes, it's $80 for the beer. My point exactly. Parking a hundred. shit, play in a local bar, charge yeah, yeah. five bucks, say, hey, tonight we're going to do whatever the fuck we want yeah, to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's great, but at $300, yeah. $400, $500, $800, yeah. I'm sorry, man. Nope. You got to deliver the goods to the people. Yeah. And you got to make the most people the most happy. And that is the compromise that one kind of has to make if one wants to make their audiences happy. But yeah. if, here's the thing I, I did notice about three years ago, I forgot what band it was, but they started out of their tour with five songs from the new album. And oh, then yeah. Then a week and then later it was four songs. Yeah. And a week later it was three songs. Stones did that. And it was like two songs. Yeah. And it was like, here's the one song from the new yeah, album. Yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. One song. Yeah. All right, before you get out of here, how long are you in town for? Uh, we're in town for another week. All right, cool. Maybe you we'll... want to go to Norm's? 100%. Spend, we should go spend a day up at Norm's. Uh, uh, 100%. I'm All right, in. I think he's in on Thursday. Yeah, I love Norm. Let's give him a shout out. Oh, yeah, would you let him know? And yeah. Come up? yeah. Last thing I was going to ask, I mean, we got to... Of course, everybody always asks you, twisted, twisted, twisted. They're going to play ever again or whatever. But I did see that D said, at one point, the offers are going to get to where we just can't say no. Who fields the offers and do they, of course, they come from the promoters every year. Who is that guy? Is it you or D? No, it's, it's, uh, it's our agent, Danny Stanton. Oh, oh got you. Yeah. our agent. And so does he call you and go, this year it was a million a show? Yeah, this year it's like this. And, you know, the thing is, when people say to us, how come our music is in so many commercials? Like, we, we, just, we just signed Walmart. Yeah. For I Want to Rock. We just did a, a O Come All You Faithfuls on a Christmas show, right? Yeah. We did all this stuff. Um, it's, just, it's just people come to us because we have the most usable songs in of the history. Of course. So what happens? They come to us. So this year, we'd been dormant for seven years. They came to us. They threw the offers out. We looked at the offers for next year and said, no, you know, not yet. The number's yeah. not ready yet. Yeah, yeah. So maybe in another year, the number's. And you know what? If it's not ever, never ready, I don't care. Yeah, right. Right, care. exactly. If it if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. I got nothing left to prove with nine thousand for me, since I'm the only original member going back to seventy three, with nine thousand performances under my belt, it doesn't need to happen again. But if it does, we will do it on ten, just like we always do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, all those Midwestern bands that don't get the respect by the Rock and Roll right. Hall of Fame, which is insulting. Yeah, yeah. Because they kept this music business alive when the music business was dying. Oh, yeah. And yet they don't want to pay attention to sticks. They don't want to pay attention to, to foreigners Argus, finally wagon, getting there. Yeah. Of, look, yeah. you can hate Nugent's politics, whatever. These artists embodied rock and roll and yeah. kept the business alive, and they have been dissed. And that's why I think the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame just is just out of touch. Listen, I'm a New York guy. If I wasn't in Twisted Sister, I would probably be just quoting chapter and verse the mentality that that goes into the selectivity of putting the Velvet Underground. I get and it. And the Ramones. I get it. You're like, I mean, they're all fine, yeah. but that's not Rock and Roll Hall of Fame stuff to me. Yeah, it's yeah. just not really. But I kind of get it. Right. And uh, and and. I will just say this about Nugent. I saw him open for Aerosmith in 75, and yeah. he was unbelievable. Dude, I saw him at 78. He blew, blew my mind. And we used to play Cat Scratch Fever. Right. We used, to play, we used to play a bunch of his songs. And my point just being is that it's, it's selectively weird who they decide to ignore and who they decide to accept. Of course. Twisted Sister's not in it. And, you know, like, we're just not hip enough. Like, right. like Long Isle's not hip enough. Meanwhile, meanwhile, I'm sorry. Does 35 million, sell, uh, 35 million albums sold? Does, uh, does 37 Golden Platinum albums... In in eight countries 
uh, internationally headlined in 40 countries, um, have the most licensed songs in the history of heavy metal, more so than ACDC, Kiss, Aerosmith. Our songs are in more movies, TV, soundtracks, commercials. Um, I'm sorry, is there a qualification I'm missing here? <laughs> is there some kind of qualification that I'm missing here? Yeah. The fact that the band has been together for 52 years, the fact that we've played 9,000 performances, is there something I'm missing here about the work ethic that we put in, the American work ethic right. of killing yourself yeah. for, and, and against all odds making it and blasting off and yet still be ignored, it's un it's unfortunate. Yeah, that's why I relate with Twisted Sister. I'm always like, wait a minute, am I missing something here? I've done 6,000 shows. I've been on stage 40 years. What am I missing here? Yeah, what the worth that game? The 12 and a half years of podcasting in the top 50 every week? What is going on? You what know is what going mean? on? I'm the yeah, same yeah, way. Yeah, and right. then you know what I always that's say? why I love you, brother. Stay hungry. That's why I love you, man. Thanks, Thank you guys, so much, for man. tuning in.